the pizza and for that introduction that was very, very, very kind. Um, so my name is Jason Finkelman. I'm an immigration attorney. I've been practicing for almost 10 years. Um, and the focus of my practice is um, employment-based immigration. So uh, focusing on how to get you guys and other international people work visas to work for employers. Um, doing a lot of work with international entrepreneurs, startups, helping those individuals find options to work here in the US. I work with students, I work with families. Um, anything immigration related is sort of what I do. But today, I wanna to focus on the H-1B work visa, which I'm sure most of you are somewhat familiar with. And I really wanna make this a casual, uh, uh, informative, useful event. This can get super technical, this stuff. Um, and I want you guys to walk out of here uh, really with all of your questions answered and really a full understanding of how the H-1B visa works. So I'm gonna talk um, and I'll try to go through it fast and hit the, the, the big points of it and I will take questions at the end so everyone's questions will get answered. If I'm saying something that totally doesn't make any sense or is not clear, just raise your hand and I'll figure out a way to make sure it makes sense. Cool? Mm -hmm. Sweet. Um, so, uh, what do we got here? Down is forward. Down is forward. Boom. H-1B non-immigrant visa category. Okay, so here's how this works. The H-1B visa is a non-immigrant visa, which means it's a temporary visa, good for uh, up to six years. Uh, uh, initially you get three years uh, you can apply again for a three-year extension for a maximum of six years that's the length of the visa it's in a specialty occupation this is called the specialty occupation so what is a specialty occupation it is a job that normally requires a bachelor's degree okay so what is a job that normally doesn't require a bachelor's degree probably barista at Starbucks right um, but accountant a software developer uh, um, systems analysts, things like that, are jobs that typically require a bachelor's degree and would qualify as an H-1B uh, uh, specialty occupation. The job um, candidate, you, have to have at least a bachelor's degree in that general field to apply for the job. So your employer says, okay, we're gonna sponsor you for an H-1B visa for this job. This job normally requires a bachelor's degree. You have at least a bachelor's degree in that field. And that's really the basic requirements of the H-1B visa, okay? Um, let's go to the next slide here. This is a employer-sponsored visa. This is, a, this is one of the critical slides here. So an H-1B worker is tied to that employer, which is to say, if that employer is sponsoring you, you are tied to working for that employer. You cannot work for multiple employers, okay? Um, the H-1B is job specific uh, to the title and the duties. So that's to say, if you come here and you're working as a software developer and your duties are developing software, whatever those things are, if you were to change to a different title or a different job duty, typically, you would have to amend that H-1B. So you're really locked in, at least for that three years, to working in that job with those job duties. Um, the first big question, I'm gonna try and hit the questions that I think most of you guys are going to have, and that is, can I self-sponsor myself for an H-1B visa? The answer to that is generally no. The H-1B is an employer-sponsored visa, so that is an employer sponsoring for you. Now, there are limited circumstances where if you had a business here in the US and you had hypothetically a board of directors that really controlled and owned that US business and they were the ones sponsoring you for that, even though it's your business, if you can show that board of directors owns and controls that US entity, that may work for H-1B purposes, H-1B visa purposes. Um, question? No? Um, wage requirements. 
employer must pay a prevailing wage. So historically what happened with this visa, people were like, sweet, I'm going to get an uh, international worker in here. I'm going to pay him nothing and he's going to work for me. Not really fair, right? Department of Labor said, that's not cool. You can't do that. We're stepping in and we are going to tell you what is the minimum prevailing wage in which you must pay this person. That wage is determined based on the geographic region you'll be working in and the job you'll be working in, the duties of that job. And Department of Labor basically has an encyclopedia of all the jobs that exist. And they basically say, in Austin, Texas, a software developer who's coming in with a bachelor's degree should make no less than this. Your employer, when they file that H-1B petition, they're going to file what's called a labor condition application, LCA. And in that, they are going to sign a document and submit it to the Department of Labor that says, we promise to pay Mr. or Mrs. X no less than this wage, which is the wage set forth by the Department of Labor for that job. Um, the employee cannot accept payment from another source. So that employer is the one paying you, can't be another person paying you. It is that employer that is the one uh, paying you. The other huge question I get here is, um, the employee cannot reimburse or pay the employer for the H-1B. And I think just in that statement right there, I crushed a lot of souls in this room that just were going, oh, but I'm gonna go to my employer and be like, hey, hey you don't have to worry about it. I got it. I'm gonna pay you. I'll reimburse you for it. Just sponsor me. I just need you to sponsor me, right? Can't do it. There's a lot of uh, 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 fraud. There's a lot of issues with um, people being taken advantage of because of that and U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS says no. Employer must pay for all of the fees, all the legal fees and all the government filing fees for that H-1B petition. If you get caught reimbursing or paying your employer for that, psh, big trouble, you're gone. That H-1B is taken away and you're going home. So if that was a thought in anyone's mind, don't get involved with that. Um, is it time for questions or should sure, yeah, if you got a question, sure. But can you negotiate with your employer that maybe they can pay for it, but then discount it like, from your salary? Good question, no. <laughs> Good question, no. So it's basically them saying, look, we are sponsoring you as our employee to come work for us. We have a duty to pay you this much, and we have a duty to basically hire you and sponsor you for this. We're responsible for you while you're here. If anything happens, we're responsible for you. And, Go ahead. Okay, so that makes sense. But does that also include like lawyer fees and stuff? Exactly, so yes. Like the whole cost? The whole thing. We'll talk about one small fee in, in, a, in a slide in a little bit, but consider it as all the fees. Okay. Okay? The H-1B cap. H-1B visa, 85,000 visas issued annually. They all become available on April 1st to begin working on October 1st. So here's how it happens, I'm playing you the movie. April 1st, all the attorneys, all the employers, everyone sends in the H-1B petitions for you guys. 85,000 visas are available, broken down into 65,000 for people who have at least a bachelor's degree, 20,000 for people who have a master's degree. In years where the economy wasn't so good, and there wasn't a big demand for STEM workers and things like that. Okay, 85,000 visas on April 1st. Maybe they are used up sometime in May, June, July. As many of you guys know, that's no longer the case. Last year, on April 1st, anyone wanna guess how many visa petitions were received on the first few days? Man, why don't you, you guys come up here and do this, yeah. 233,000 over, right? So think about that. Last year, if you're filing your H-1B petition, you had less than a 35% chance of getting that visa. Why? All those visas are taken, 233,000. USCIS says, okay, we're putting on a press release, please do not send any more H-1B petitions in. We're gonna take the 233,000 we received in the first week we're gonna put them in a computer-generated random lottery. We're gonna let the computer select the 85,000 that are going to be processed. The rest are sent back to the employers. Psh, sorry, try again another year. 
Think about that for a second. Less than a 35% chance of getting out. The year before, I think it was 172,000 over like that. So the trend is getting harder and harder. My guess this year, it's gonna be even harder. I don't know what that number is, but the trend's going up. Um, Individual, yeah. Sorry, uh, the breakdown between uh, non-master and op, and do, do you have numbers on that? On like if the percentage was higher for, obviously, like, you know, the, the 20,000 mm -hmm. that have masters or higher, what was the breakdown of that? Did they, would they, were they providing that information at all? Or Good saying? question, and I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I don't know the answer. But to that point, individuals who have a master's degree or higher actually get two plays in the lottery. So basically how it works is if you've got a master's degree or higher, they're going to say, okay, the 20,000 in excess of 20,000 that we got, we're going to have a lottery for those people first. If you're not selected in that, we'll give you a chance to play with the 65,000 here. Okay? So you get two bites at the apple if you've got a master's degree or higher. Um, yeah, yeah. Let me get him and I'll get you. Is that only from a U.S. institution, though, or? No. So you do not have to graduate from a U.S. institution. You can graduate from a foreign institution. How that works is uh, uh, you would have to get your academic credentials evaluated here to say that they are equivalent to at least a U.S. bachelor's degree. Typically, they are. So if, let's say that I apply and I don't get, I don't win the lottery, do I have to pay and do the whole process again next year? Or? Great question. So if, if you are not selected in the lottery, remember, again, it's the employer who's selected, oh, yeah. technically. If the employer's petition that he's filing on your behalf is not selected, that employer would get his money back minus the legal fees, but he would get the government filing fees back. And then yes, they would say, try again another year. Okay, did everyone get that? Yes. How much is that filing fees? Great, great question. So we're gonna break that down in another slide. We'll talk about it now. So the, the filing fees are, uh, the government filing fees are $325, one is $500. The other one depends on the size of the employer. It's either $750 if you have less than 25 employees, $1,500 if you have more than 25 employees. So I'm not, I hope you guys are doing the math because I'm not doing the math in my head right now. Uh, there's a new filing fee this year for employers who have, I believe it's uh, a certain percentage of their workforce is H-1B employees. I think it's like 50 or something like that. If your employer has 50 or more H-1B employees, they also have to pay an additional $4,000. Um, and then there's what's called a premium processing fee, and we'll talk about that in, in a second. Um, so whoever's doing the math, you can shout out the number, or, or we'll get to it in a second. Um, so any questions about the cap? Any other questions? So there are certain organizations that are actually exempt from the cap, which means they can apply for an H-1B at any time, and they don't have to worry about that 85000 Okay. Those are college and university employees, uh, uh, related or affiliate nonprofit entities, university teaching hospitals, schools, things like that, nonprofit research organizations, and government research organizations. So if you have a job offer from one of those organizations, you're good to go. You don't need to worry about the, the H 1B lottery. Okay? The other issues with CAF exemption are if you're moving now from one of these organizations, if you get an H-1B through one of these three cap exempt organizations and now you're going to a private employer, you gotta worry now, I gotta go play the lottery, okay? If you're getting an extension, if you, once, you're, once you've gone through the H-1B lottery, you're good. So if you're extending your H-1B thereafter or you're changing to another H-1B employer, you're good, you don't need to worry about the lottery anymore. Cool? So let's break down the process a little more. So the first step in the process is this uh, labor condition application, the LCA. So the LCA is, uh, usually takes about seven days to process. And this is important because for any of your employers that are going, well, we'll think about the H-1B, you know, it's April 1st, and it's beginning of February, like, come back to me, we'll talk about it a little bit. If you wait too long into March and you don't, file this early enough, you may not have this prerequisite step taken care of and certified by the Department of Labor by April 1st. 
So I tell most people, you want to get this done by the latest, the second week of March. Because by the third, fourth week of March, someone's coming to me, I'm going, okay, but I don't know if we can get this certified, this LCA certified by the Department of Labor in time. So it's going to be dicey. Not saying it's impossible, you know, but, but it usually takes about seven days to get that part taken care of. Um, going back to the fees, so again, 325, 500, either 750 or 1500. There's that new $4,000 fee. So the totals there for the government filing fees are either $1,575 or $2,325, right? Plus $4,000 if you're an employer with 50 employees, of which 50% are H-1B visa employees. There's another thing in here called premium processing. I'm going to dispel a little bit of a rumor. So premium processing is a service offered by USCIS that says, hey, you know what? You pay us $1,225, we'll give you an answer on this in 15 days. It's optional, you don't have to pay us. But if you do, we'll give you an answer in 15 days. So people go, oh man, let's pay this extra $1,225 because it'll give me an answer in 15 days and I'll know and maybe it'll give me a leg up in the lottery. Rumor, false, doesn't give you any leg up on anything. There are very, very limited circumstances, usually applies for students who need some type of work authorization to pay that premium processing fee. In vast majority of cases, it's not uh, worth it. Going back to your question, that is the only fee that may be paid by an employee. Okay. But in most cases, it's not gonna apply to you guys. Um, last step, so uh, typically, oh, I'll get your question in one sec. Uh, the last step there is once that visa is selected, last year it was about six to eight weeks, I think it was, when we heard who was selected in the lottery and who wasn't. And basically you find out if you're selected in the lottery because the ones that aren't are sent back to the attorney or the employer. So I go, well, these ones didn't get selected. Anyone else who's not in this probably got selected. Then a couple weeks after you would get a notice that says, hey, we've accepted it, we're processing it now, meaning someone's sitting there looking at your application. And that process takes about three to five months. Not a big deal, right? Because April 1st, can't work until October 1st, okay? Um, questions about this? There was someone in the back, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, are the fees the same for the nonprofit and governmental agencies? They are, they are. Um, Jason, I got a question too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the lottery, yes. do they hold any additional applications to the side to fill in in case some of the 85,000 that the computer selected don't qualify and they get kicked out. Love it, love it, great question. And I'm going to make you crestfallen because our wonderful USCIS says yes, every year there's some that we actually select and they get denied. So Reason says, well then can't someone else get that H-1B visa? And USCIS goes, well yeah, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> So each year there are, and, and they've now over the years have, have grown to thousands of extra available H-1B visas that just don't get used. So yes, it's a bummer. Second part of that question, and we'll get to it in another slide. Any individuals in here from uh, Singapore or Chile? Ah, too bad. Singapore and Chile, out of that 85,000, we're gonna take out 6,800 and reserve those for only Chilean and Singapore nationals. Why? They've got a nice program for US workers and we reciprocate with them. That's the short answer. Okay? And that's part of the 85 though. That is part of the 85. So 85,000 minus 6,800, those are going to Chilean and Singapore nationals. Those are called H-1B-1 visas. Cool? Yeah. Sucks, guys. Trust me, I, I, we can talk about it afterwards, and I do a lot of advocacy work uh, on, behalf, on behalf of all you guys to try and say, hey, this is a no-brainer. These are intelligent people we should be bringing here, and unfortunately, that's not the case. Yeah, Ali? So how long does it take to, get, to become a Singapore or Chilean? <laughs> nah, good question. Do you know, someone actually asked me that recently, and I was like, I should actually look that up. But people have asked me that before. Um, You'll have a better chance. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's talk about briefly for any students in here something called the H-1B cap gap, okay? So the, this cap gap occurs when, when an F-1 visa holder 
is the beneficiary of an approved H-1B petition, but his or her F-1 status and OPT work authorization expire before October 1st. So what previously used to happen was there's this gap, right, from when the F-1 status to the beginning of the H-1B status, and it would create this, this big sort of immigration consequence, I guess. Um, so DHS, Department of Homeland Security, created this rule called the H-1B cap gap. So if you're an F-1 student and you're on OPT and your employer timely files the H-1B, April 1st, requests a change of status, which would be from your F-1 status to H-1B, requesting October 1st start date, uh, and it is selected in that lottery, you would get this uh, uh, cap gap provision. I'm going to show you an illustration in the next slide uh, that would allow you to work here until October 1st. Previously, there was a problem with that where people were going, okay, cool, I got selected, but now I got to go home and wait to come back October 1st. One thing Department of Homeland Security did right was they're like, uh, yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Let's give them this provision. Um, so here's what that looks like uh, as an illustration. So if, for example, this EAD employment authorization document, your document that allows you to work, let's say hypothetically expires on July 25th, 2016, if your employer timely files that H-1B on April 1st, you would actually, and it's selected, right, and it's selected in that lottery, you would get your OPT extended to allow you to work here in the U.S. from July 25th to October 1, 2016. Does that illustration make sense? Yeah. Um, that's, that's only if you get selected. That's only if you get selected. So going back to this, if you're rejected or if you're selected and it's denied for some reason, you're done. How long do you know? How long do you have after your OPT expires to remain in the states? A after your OPT expires. Yeah. So typically after your OPT expires, it's about 60 days to sort of wind up and get ready to go home. Sweet. But you, the issue there becomes you can't really work because your OPT is expired, right? Right. Yeah. What if you don't know the, if your H-1B got cut or if the employer, the H-1B got picked or not and your EAD expires? Like for example, mine expires on uh, June 18th. And what if I do not know if my H-1B got picked can't can't work until you know whether that's been selected. Okay. You'll you'll likely know again six to eight weeks. I'd say you should find out whether you've been selected or not. Okay. So, for example, in the case that I'm working already here, but uh, with a visa, I have already a visa. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, I don't know. I, I find another company that uh, is willing to sponsor the the H one B. Mm -hmm. So, what would be what? What is this scenario? I mean, in this case, what will happen? Because I'm already working with a visa, but I'm filing for another, to work with another company, which is trying to sponsor me the H-1B. So if you already have an H-1B. No, I don't. It's not H-1B. Okay, so you would be getting a new H-1B? It's, it's all of this applies. So basically, you find an employer here, even though you're on a work visa already, yeah. you're saying, please change my status from whatever my current status is to H-1B, and then cross your fingers, you gotta go through the lottery, likely lottery, and 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 hope you get selected. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. I just, I, sure. yeah, I just wanted, yeah, I just wanted okay. to make sure that, okay, if, uh, because I, I already have a visa, so if I file for the H-1B, if there's any conflict, I don't know that that's the, you know, the immigration No conflict, so it's called a change of status, so technically, once that happens, it's just change in a computer. So if you're here as an F-1 student, once you're selected on October 1st, you change to H-1B status. So, related to that, if you um, if you get denied for the change of status, mm -hmm. can you just carry on with the with the let's say a TN visa or something? Can you just keep going with that? You can, so long as you still qualify, qualify. for that visa. Yeah, yeah. just b because an H-1B is denied doesn't mean your current status is denied. Right. So long as that status is still valid. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of related. So sure. What's the difference if you have the H-1B? <laughs> you can. So once you get through that lottery, once you've got an H-1B, you're good to go. So you can change to another employer so long as that employer sponsors you. So that new employer says, yes, we're willing to pay all those fees all over again, but we don't have to worry about the lottery. Oh, okay. so, so at any point, we can file this new H-1B uh, change of employer is what it's called. And is it six years regardless of it? 
No, so the six years is cumulative. So we're counting any H-1B status you already have. You, so if you're here two years, you would get four years with the new employer. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, a couple more slides, and then we'll, uh, we'll open up to some more questions. Uh, H-1B portability, I think that sort of answers your question, which we just talked about. Um, you can port to a new employer once you already have your H-1B status. Um, individuals who are terminated, um, either by the employer or you quit, currently you have about 30 days to sort of wind up things and get out. There was a proposed rule actually last week um, that says let's actually codify that and make it 60 days, but that's not currently the case. Uh, but I anticipate that to be the case coming up soon, about 60 days. That 30 days is just, it's not actually the rule. The rule is you have a, quote, reasonable period of time to wind up everything and leave. Immigration practitioners say, look, you got about 30 days to either find a new employer or go home. That's just, that's, that's our rule of thumb. Hey, Jason? Yes. <clears throat> On the portability, are the fees for a new employer um, anywhere near what they were to get the H-1B in the first place? Exact same. change of status, it is. Exact same. You just don't have a lottery, but it's refiling of all the same stuff and the same fees. Bingo. All over again. All over again. Wow. Yep. Jason, can yes. you file for those fees any time of year? You don't have to wait until April? April's just a lottery, right? Right, just that first, it's, think about it this way, H-1B, April 1 lottery is new H-1B. Okay. Once you got an H-1B, whenever Anytime you want. Any time of year. Any time of year. Okay. You're not subject to the cap. Um, so, in the odds, some of us aren't going to get the H-1B, right? So what are some other options? Uh, let's talk about these briefly, because this really is, I want this to focus on H-1Bs and, and answer your questions, but a couple of the more popular options, E-1 and E-2, uh, Treaty Trader and Treaty Investor Visa. If you are a national of India, China, Russia, Brazil, forget it, it doesn't apply to you. So I know I disappointed some people in this room. <laughs> But this is how this works. Uh, the US has treaties with certain countries. It allows for individuals who are making substantial trade or a substantial investment in the US to come here and run that uh, uh, trade or run that substantial investment. So that doesn't apply to Russia, right? This does not apply to Russia. Okay. You're from Russia? Those four, all of them. No, I'm just talking about the E1, E2, okay. right? just the E1, E2. And that's okay. super expensive, right? can be because substantial investment uh, uh, depends on what the business is. The trend over time has been to make that investment larger and larger, to make it look like you're really coming to run a big investment here. Um, it all depends on the size of the business and what the business is, but it's a larger number. Um, and it also, because there's a lot of money laundering and fraud issues in that, it gets into a very long thing of, uh, of tracking the source of funds. I think someone here tweeted out a picture once at Capital Factory of an E1, E2 visa that I did that was, I kid you not, three feet high oh, yeah. for one person. So uh, it's somewhere here in Capital Factory, somewhere yeah, yeah. but they can, get, they can get crazy. They can get, yeah, yeah, I see your eyes. That's, that's, that's what I thought when I was putting it together. I was like, yeah. Um, L1, L1 is a very popular visa. Again, for all these guys, um, no caps, no caps. So you can apply at any time of the year. The other one is an intra-company transferee. So if you are abroad and you've worked for a company in an executive, managerial, or specialized knowledge capacity for one out of the last three years, and you're coming to the US to work for an entity that has a corporate relationship with that foreign entity, and you're also coming here to work in an executive, managerial, or specialized knowledge capacity, you can come here under that L1 visa. Very versatile visa, nice visa. Uh, we talked briefly about the H-1B one, Singapore, Chile, no one in here. Sorry, you, you're, you're a privileged class if you were. E3, actually very popular. I don't know how many of you know Australians, but it seems there's a lot of Australians moving to Austin. E3 is essentially like a H-1B for Australians only. Similar to the H-1B, um, but only applies to Australian nationals. Uh, lastly, the TN. Any individuals from Mexico, Canada? Boom, boom, yes, awesome. So uh, again, the TN is a great visa only for Mexicans, only for Canadians. 
uh, allows you to work in only certain job categories. It's a long list. You can Google them, the NAFTA job categories, accountants, uh, I think there's some type of technical stuff, engineers. Um, you can come and work uh, uh, for a limited uh, time and get that visa extended uh, indefinitely, so long as you can prove your non-immigrant intent uh, to work here in the U.S. when they're TN. Yes? So, I know for a fact that you cannot with the TN, but does any of these visas allow you to get a green card? So, all of, well, any of these visas may allow you to get a green card. That process is a longer, more difficult process. Think about this as your non-immigrant visa. USCIS says, look, you want to come to the U.S.? You want to work temporarily? Okay, prove to me the criteria of these visas and I'll let you come in temporarily one, two, three, four years to work for that. Now, when you say to that employer, I want to be here permanently, I want to get a green card, USCIS says, whoa, 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 wait a second. You want to be here permanently in the US? That's a pretty big privilege we're going to extend to you. So we either have to do a test of the US labor market and see if there's any qualified, able, willing, or available US people who can do what you do. Or, and there's a long list of sort of exceptions and rules and things like that and get into it. But with any of these visas, yes, it's possible to come here and then apply somewhere later on down the road for a green card, either an employment-based green card or, or some other method. Even with the TN? So, the answer to that question technically is it's difficult with a TN. Okay. But you can come here, you can work, you can get that experience. I sort of say to people, worry about that process later. Come here. If you really want to be here and you want to work, get that experience, see who you meet, be here at Capital Fact. Who knows what the future holds, right? It, it, I want to save that. That's a, it's a technical question, what you're, what you're asking, and I, I want to keep this H1B focused. But, generally um, any other questions so I really just wanted to keep it as brief as I can I hope I answered a lot of the general questions but I, I want to open this up and make this valuable for you yes it's the H -B cap oh sorry I was I was looking at him but you yes first go ahead all right is the H -B cap portable to other uh, like no profits or universities I, I'm not sure it's be cap or no profits right or universities is it transferable or portable, like you said, to other uh, nonprofits or universities? If I understand your co correct your, your your question, you're saying can you apply for a cap exempt organization and then move onto a different one? You can, but then you're subject to the lottery. So no, they're both cap exempt organizations. Can oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You can move from, yeah from cap exempt yeah yeah. So long as it's a cap exempt organization, absolutely. Awesome presentation, man. Thank you, I appreciate it. So, uh, um, uh, I'm currently on um, OPT, uh -huh. and uh, uh, I understand that uh, STEM students get an extension for like another year or so. Um, so, what is the, the, the? There's a long list of majors that mm -hmm. you know like are uh, subject to that mm -hmm. STEM exemption. Um, uh, so um, uh, what if I'm not sure about whether my major qualifies within it? What if there's this one major that is like, hey, that's what I studied? That is a question for the university. The university should be able to answer that. OK, cool. I don't, I don't know, but that is, that's a great question. I'm curious as to what it is. What? Your cool degree or your cool major. Uh, I mean, like, I did economics and communications, and there's a digital communications and media uh, major that's uh, subject to a STEM exemption, so I can like. That's, uh, talk to the university. They should be able to answer that question. That's kind of interesting, that's kind of unique. Yes? So I heard different answers from different attorneys about uh -oh. how you can sponsor, <laughs> sponsor yourself, uh, because I'm having my startup, but I'm currently on OPT extension, so. I heard one of the attorneys that uh, uh, that was the old rule that you cannot apply for yourself. Yeah, great question. One of the more popular questions, especially from people here at Capital Factory who are entrepreneurs and startups. The general answer to that question is no. The H-1B visa is not for self-sponsorship. Now, what could it look like 
practically speaking, where it could work. Again, if you had a US company that you were willing to now give up control of that company, meaning you were giving up 51% of that company to someone else, or a board of directors, and you can document, hey, I have no control, maybe I don't have the ownership here, this board of directors controls me. They basically say when I come, what I do, what I get paid, all that stuff like that. It may be possible. There are attorneys, I, stuff like that I do, it is kind of on the cutting edge, but I've had success with those in the past if you can document that you're not controlling yourself because self-sponsorship is very clear. Oh yeah, it's my company, I own it. You can't self-sponsor yourself. No, that's not gonna work. You can show there's a board of directors and hey, they have control. Here's documentation of it, here's the operating agreement, whatever it says. They're telling me what I'm to do. It might work. So you have to be uh, own less than 50% of the company? Or is this something you think? The employer-employee relationship for H-1B purposes is described, is, is broken down into ownership and control. Okay. And that's what they will zero in on without a doubt. So you want to make it really clear that there's someone else controlling me. I am an employee of this company. Okay, so it, it, it's a facts and circumstances test. So how do you usually find out if, they just, if you just file H-1B, do they check if you own the company? Of course. Okay. Yeah, no, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, you must establish an employer-employee relationship. And we can go off on a tangent on what a, a good attorney would do to establish for a regular company the employer-employee relationship. I mean, you can talk to Fred sometimes, the, the people I work with here, I mean, you know, having to show, oh, here's where I go, and here's where I work, and here's what they tell me I wear, and here's when I can go to lunch, and things. USCIS is very, very old school. Unfortunately, immigration laws in this country are very archaic, and they picture in their head, like, you walking into work, punching your clock, sitting there with your hard hat, sitting here, it's the truth. It's the truth, and that's what they want to see. They sit there with their check boxes and, and mark that stuff off. So it's unfortunate, but yes. So I was saying, I mean, let me develop and evolve on that. I was saying that if a, if a guy comes from Europe, Russia, France, Asia, whatever, um, and then uh, um, starts a company here mm -hmm. and finds an investor, and but still. Uh, he or she would, would own more than 50%, say 60% of the company. Who would? The, the founder. Uh -huh. And then there is a couple of other guys who own like 20% and then investors. Then the, the founder won't get the, the visa. It's going to be tough. Think about it this way. Let's say in that hypothetical you say, I'm the founder of the company. I own 60% of the company. I want to file that visa. Mm -hmm. Put on the head, put on your hat as the USCIS officer and go, wait a sec, this is supposed to be an employer-sponsored visa where you're the employee, but you own 60% of the company. How are you the employee? Who's controlling you? You have control of the company, right? It's, it's difficult. It's challenging. Okay, so are you saying that it's not possible? I'm saying I, I wouldn't do that because I do not think it would be successful. Okay. And what is the, uh, I mean, I, I know that's not H-1B uh, question. What is the recent practice on the visitor visas? Um, I mean, do they still allow to be for six months uh, and then leave the country and then like in a week or so come back? Yeah. I mean, what is the recent, like, two, yeah. three years? Quick tangent. His question is, what's the, the new rules or what's going on with visitor visas? And this is a question I get a lot, which is, can I come here to the U.S. and work on a visitor visa? Can, how long can I stay? Those sorts of issues. Uh, no, you cannot come here and do any work on a visitor visa. People say to me next, but Jason, I'm not getting paid. Doesn't matter. USCIS defines work as anything that a normal person would get paid for, regardless whether you're getting paid. Their, the answer to your question is on the timeline. Still six months, you can get a maximum. You have to show that you have reason to be here for six months for business visitor purposes. And uh, under the visa waiver program, that's also becoming more difficult too. So under the, the B1 or under the visa waiver program, 
because of things that happened last year in Paris and California, they're changing those programs and it is becoming very, very difficult now to uh, uh, come to the US for extended periods of time or trying to come in for six months then leave for a day and come back in for another six months. USCIS is not stupid. They know people play games all the time. That's all they do. All day they're thinking, what is this game this person's trying to play with me? And they, they, they don't take kindly to What's that. your recommendation? If you don't get your H-1B, what should you do? Unfortunately, there are not many options. We talked about in that last slide some of the other options. If you qualify, oops, no, this one here, I don't know if I can blow it up again. Um, some of these other visa options might work, but if not, you gotta go home. A yeah. friend of mine is applying for an old visa. Yes. For like extraordinary talents. Because uh, he's a founder and he's also um, like looking to get that visa. How does that work? Yeah, the O-1 visa is a visa for aliens of quote, extraordinary ability in the arts, science, mathematics, business. Um, extraordinary ability, guys, is a very, very high level. That's not to say you have to be the tippy top of your field, but you have to evidence with a lot of information that you've done something that really is remarkable. So whether it's patents or writing in international journals or speaking at big conferences or winning types of awards, if you can document with a lot of that information that you really are sort of top of your field, you may be eligible to uh, uh, um, get an O-1 visa. Okay. Let's say that you have all the proof to say that you're an extraordinary talent. Is that also similar to the H-1B in terms no of? No cap, you can apply at any time. It's employer sponsored. Okay. You gotta find an employer who says, we need to bring in this person to come work for us, but no cap. So you can apply you at any time. You have to prove that you're extraordinary in your country or for the US? You have to show your international extraordinary ability. So it could be in your home country, it could be in other countries, it could be showing that. Intergalactic. <laughs> it's right. Do they give a lot of those? Uh, there's no cap. So yeah, you can. There's no cap on the amount of visas, so you can get it at any time. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Yes. All right. So you co-founded a company. Well, you're trying to trying to do that. You have less than fifty percent. Um, you have a board of directors. How much revenue do you need to apply for an H one? Another great question, man. I thought I was gonna like cover all the questions you guys were gonna answer, but that's another popular one I get. Here's the answer to that. Technically, the law does not say that you have to show for H-1B purposes that ability to pay the wage that you're saying in the, in the labor condition application, right? So backing up in the labor condition application, let's say you're gonna be the software developer for the company, in that labor condition application, Department of Labor says, in Austin, a software developer, I'm making this up now, makes a minimum of $50,000 a year, okay? So, one of the issues it's raised is, well, what if I'm a startup? What if I don't have that money to pay that? Technically, the law doesn't say you have to prove it. Practically speaking, USCIS does want to see some information that shows that you can actually pay this person the wage you're gonna claim you're promising to pay this person. So, if you don't have tax returns, if you don't have uh, um, already an established business, maybe you can get, uh, put money in a bank account, maybe you can get letters from uh, um, accountants, uh, business plans, things that show potential revenue, contracts, signed contracts. Uh, as long as there's something that shows, hey look, we have the potential to make this, we can back that up and maybe you get a letter from an account somewhere or a bank that says, yes, their business plan makes sense. We do believe that they can make this in this year. That I've seen is sort of reasonable for USCIS. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. What if you already have an H-1, but you want to start your business on the side and you already have those conditions? Yeah, another, another, another popular question, no. So you were tied to your employer, going back to I think it was like the second or third slide, you're tied to your employer. Especially, I get this question a lot in, in, in capital factory and sort of corporate space. But yeah, but I met this guy and we're doing this thing. It's really cool. It's really sweet. Yeah, it's a balance test, right? So you don't want to get caught really devote. Where, where are you devoting your efforts, time, and energy? Okay. So if 
you know, you meet with some guy once a week for a cup of coffee and you're talking about things, eh, okay, maybe. But as you start to sort of move your time and efforts and energy to this side thing that you're going on, where are you really devoting your efforts and energy to? to? It's the side thing and not this employer. You don't want to get caught in that situation because if USCIS finds out you're doing some side thing and you're not devoting your time to your H-1B employer, psh, we're taking back that H-1B. So you can't have more than one H-1B at the same time? The, the technical answer is that yes. He's just looking for loopholes. Uh, oh, this, this team not, I'm not surprised, man. I get these questions all day long. It's a, it's, a, it's a totally legit question. I think it's stupid. I think it's ridiculous. But that's the law. Right. Do yeah. certain sectors get favored during that lottery, or is that? No, another good question. So everyone's favored the same, whether you're working for two-person startup here or Facebook or Google, everyone's weighted the same in that H-1B lottery. Yes? Okay, so I'm currently on Medicaid, and I'm currently on a TD visa. Okay. So, and let's say he applies for the H-1B visa, what will yeah, so her question, her question is what is the, uh, if, if you, one of you in this room, gets an H-1B visa, what does your spouse get to do or your children? So your spouse would get what's called an H-4 visa and your children would get an H-4 visa. Unfortunately, that does not provide work authorization. So you get to hang out. Um, there, there was some talk about like changing it and they have some sort of like a pilot program or something. Yeah, so there goal. currently is, and again, this gets very, very technical, but if you're here after six years and you filed certain permanent resident applications, H-4 people now can get uh, employment authorization, but that's not for new H-1Bs. Mm -hmm. We hope, because a lot of these visas, spouses can get uh, uh, an employment authorization card when they're here, so we hope that maybe in the next year or two, thank you, uh, that H-4 spouses will get work authorization, but currently, no, they cannot. And could she get her own TM? I'm sorry? Could she get her own TM visa if she's an H-4? Sure, yeah. Anyone who's here as a spouse can al always find a, a U.S. employer that's willing to sponsor them for TN or H-1B, yeah. Uh, that was my question. Okay. Yeah. I read somewhere that you can change your working status of the TD to where you can work. Is that true? Or? If you apply for another work authorized visa, yeah. But not in the TD. You no, the TD does not provide work authorization. Only TN. Only TN. Yeah. I want to. I don't, I don't want this to go to the point where we're all sort of just like, what? <laughs> so for anyone who's got to go or feel like this is sufficient, by all means, thank you so much for coming. Grab some more pizza, grab some more Coke, uh, uh, Sprite, whatever you want. Um, anyone who has more questions, I'll hang out. Um, Zuffer, I want to thank again for putting this together. Let's give him a round of applause. For is back there, his card's there, my card's there. Uh, pick it up. If you have private questions you want to ask, you can email me, sign in the sign-in sheet. Um, and if you visit my website and this wasn't sufficient for you for some reason, I'm doing like half a dozen of these things over the next month. So check out my website and you can come to another one. We'll answer more. Oh yeah. And I was wanted to uh, make a quick announcement. Uh, as I said, uh, the Capital Factory, uh, we, we have started a new international program where we made a soft landing platform to help international companies move here to the U.S. And part of that is helping all you uh, startup founders and other people figure out these type of important questions, as well as questions regarding to investment, also regarding uh, how do you incorporate here. You know, what, there are many other challenges that you face, um, immigration being the biggest one, but there's also other things that you have to consider as you're moving here. So we've designed this new program as a soft landing platform. It's called Touchdown Austin uh, to help international companies move here. So, uh, it's part of the reasons why we're hosting some of these events here, and we hope to do a continual series. And, uh, Jason is actually one of our uh, partners in the interest. So anybody that uh, comes to and needs immigration help, we point them towards Jason, and he's been uh, uh, very, very helpful in the current companies that we actually have had uh, gone through the program. So. Thank you. And, and thanks to Capital Factory for hosting the event. Sweet, guys. Um,
thanks. Well, we can hang out. We can talk. Whatever you want. I just didn't want to make this so we're all sort of falling asleep here. Yeah, my contact information is also here. He's raffling off a visa at the end of the day. I know. <laughs> 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 <laughs>